I'm so excited to be here and uh, to share my story with you uh, about engineering a corporate comeback. So this is really the story of my company uh, and how geopolitical events, a little bit of bad luck uh, and a difficult market, led us to lose uh, half of our staff, huge amount of our revenue, and a little bit of our heart. But there is a happy ending, so getting there is going to be what I talk to you about today. So first, for those of you who I haven't met, and I hope I can meet all of you, uh, I am into gamification, so I'm really into that little book. Um, my name is Jess. Uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Arcadium. We make interactive content and games for media companies and publishers all over the world. Um, I'm super passionate about building my business, but I'm also very passionate about lots of other things in life. I'm a mom of three. Um, I am renovating a, a farmhouse from the 1800s in upstate New York, and I love to travel. So let me start at the beginning. Um, in the year 2000, I met my husband. We were both working at a bloated dot-com company. Uh, it was burning through cash, it was burning through people, and we looked at each other and we said, there's gotta, there's gotta be a better way. So at 24, we decided to quit our jobs and start Arcadium out of my husband Kenny's one-bedroom apartment on the Lower East Side with a $2,500 investment from his mom. Um, and because we couldn't afford to pay ourselves, uh, we certainly couldn't afford to uh, hire employees, so we actually started outsourcing. This is the early days of outsourcing. And we found a company that was based in Ukraine that we started outsourcing to. We started with about five people, and we slowly grew that business. We grew it from five to 15. And as that company grew, we grew in New York as well. Um, we grew to eventually about 100 people in that office in Ukraine over the course of years. And we actually bought an apartment there. We took our kids there in the summer. It was like a second home for us, so we spent a huge amount of time there. So. By the year 2014, Arcadium Simferopol, which is um, in the southern part of Ukraine in the Crimea region, had about 100 employees. Um, and we had about 50 in the United States at that point. So things were, going, uh, things were going fairly well for us. We were making deals with a lot of the largest media companies in the world. Um, we even created uh, the Microsoft Solitaire Collection which is the most played game of all time. It's shipped uh, on over 600 million Windows machines sold around the world. So yes, I am personally responsible for a huge amount of wasted time. <laughs> we like to think of that as stress relief at Arcadium. Um, so things were going really well for us. Sure, we had many, many ups and downs like many companies do, but in general, the future was bright and things were going well. Um, we could never have uh, known what was about to happen. So for those of you who are paying attention and, and follow the news, you heard me mention Crimea and Ukraine a few times. <laughs> uh, so you know what's coming next. Um, in early 2014, so in about January 2014, there started being major heavy uh, protesting and rioting in Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine. And very soon after, the president of the, of the country was deposed. He was kicked out of the country. Um, very shortly after, about two weeks later, um, in our city in southern Ukraine, Simferopol, these uh, masked gunmen started coming into the city and essentially taking it over. They started um, taking over all of the government buildings. And this was literally just two or three blocks away from our office. So our employees um, actually found themselves going to work, um, kind of circumnavigating around tanks, taking their kids to school while there were these soldiers uh, in the streets. Um, and it was, it was pretty scary. Um, that quickly led to President uh, Vladimir Putin getting authority to essentially use force uh, to protect the region of Crimea. And the people of Crimea uh, voted actually almost um, unanimously to leave Ukraine. They actually decided to secede and become part of the Russian Federation. So within the course of about a week, I went from owning and running a company that was based in Ukraine to owning and running a company that was now based in Russia, um, actually never having changed locations. 
So that was pretty bizarre. The next eight months uh, were incredibly difficult. Um, most of our work stopped almost completely as our staff of 100 had to do what we in this room could never consider <laughs> or even think about doing. They had to change their working papers, they had to change their citizenship, they had to change all of their bank accounts. Um, you can't imagine what it is like uh, going from being a citizen of one country to actually becoming the citizen of another country. Um, and this is all happening, obviously, in Eastern Europe. So the lines are incredible. People would wait on lines for three and four days at a time to get the most basic things done. We went from paying people in Grivna to paying people in rubles. Um, our time zone changed. That was something I didn't realize could happen when you actually stay in the same location. <laughs> but apparently Putin's got that kind of pull, so we were operating on a different time zone all of a sudden. Um, and then last but not least, our Ukrainian corporate bank account disappeared into thin air, as happens uh, sometimes when you're in the middle of a war in a crazy region. So that was really, really difficult, as you can imagine, but we were working through it. People were getting their papers. We were changing all of our corporate registrations. Um, we were slowly but surely kind of doing the, the sluggish work to actually change the company over. But all of that came to a halt on December 19th when uh, President Obama sanctioned the Crimea region, which instantly made my business illegal. So, um, Hopefully you never have to deal with this, but uh, should, should you have to, what sanctions basically mean is that as an American company, if we spoke to our employees, if we paid our employees, uh, if we tried to get code in or out of the country, we would go to prison for 25 years. So uh, this is not something, by the way, learning this in hindsight, it's, it's pretty interesting, but this is not something that the government actually tells you. So we didn't get like a certified letter. We didn't get an email <laughs> saying like, by the way, you're gonna go to jail. Um, we actually found out from a Google News alert that the region was sanctioned and we kind of had to figure out on our own what that meant and immediately call lawyers. Um, by the way, this was all happening uh, the week leading up to Christmas. So the entire government shut down the day after they announced the sanctions. There was no wind down period. There was no time to make plans. It was, today you are illegal. You cannot send your employees payroll or you will go to jail. So it was December. We had not yet paid them for the month. We were unable to give them holiday bonuses or anything along those lines. Um, so... What happened over the next three weeks was pretty extraordinary. This is now the American government is shut down for the holidays. The Russian government is shut down for the holidays, and we can't actually even speak to our employees. We somehow managed to speak via email, um, not talking about business things because that would be illegal, but how we were essentially going to move and survive. And what we figured out, basically, surreptitiously speaking to our employees, was that about 45 of them were just, they needed to stay there. They had aging parents, their entire lives were there. But about 55 of our 100 employees were actually willing to move. They were willing to move to help save the company and to help save their jobs. So over the course of the next three weeks, we actually moved 55 people and their entire families into southern Russia. So the interesting thing here is that, and kind of ironic, even though the sanctions happened as a result of the Russians invading Crimea, Russia was actually not sanctioned, right? So we could move to Russia. At this point, we were already a Russian company. We'd spent the last eight months becoming a Russian company. So we asked our employees, where do you want to move? And they said, we'll go there. And there was, was Krasnodar, which was the closest large city to where they had lived so that they could get home on the weekends if they needed to. So on January 6th, 2015, I flew to Krasnodar and I met my 55 employees and they had three box trucks that were filled with all of their worldly possessions and their families. And we set up shop in a city that they, none of them had ever actually been to um, and that I had never even heard of. 
and we set about the course of kind of figuring out how we were going to rebuild our company. Um, this was obviously a very, very difficult time for us. It cost the company hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to support moving these people and their families. It was something that we did unquestionably, but it was something that also caused us to have to reduce our staff in New York. We could simply not have um, the same number of people operating, and that necessitated us having to shut down a whole line of business. So essentially, within the span of about a month, we went from 150 employees to 75 employees, and we needed to figure out what we were gonna do to survive. But as I mentioned, this story has a happy ending, and that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today in the nine minutes I have left. So in, uh, in 18 months, we went from utter, complete chaos and disrepair to not only being named um, the first ever Best Workplace in America by Inc. Magazine, but also having our highest revenue and our highest profitability in our company's history. So let's talk about how we did that. First was celebrating the small stuff. So we had just been through a huge amount of hell, <laughs> and it was, it was quite easy for us to kind of look around and just identify all of the bad things that were happening, but we knew that in order to survive, we couldn't stay in that mindset. We had to start looking for the good. So we started celebrating the small things, and we did that with this concept that we call Lil Wins. Um, we actually gave people these little post-it sticky notes that were branded and said Lil Wins, and we encouraged them to start thinking about the things that were going well every day. And these were very, very small things. It was literally, I had a good second round interview with somebody. Um, I had a good call with a customer. Somebody said something nice to me. Whatever it was, write it down. And people started writing these down and keeping them. Um, and it was incredibly helpful because it actually retrained our brains. And this is something, if you guys have ever heard of the book or read the book, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, he talks about. It's called the Tetris Effect, which is essentially once you start seeing good, you start seeing good everywhere. So, and that's what we needed our employees to do. We needed them to believe that there were good things that were happening. Uh, and we had so many of these post-its that we actually created a wall for them in our kitchen, our little winds wall. And often I'll find employees standing up there and looking at them. And it's really beautiful because you can actually see the progress that we've made over time from these really small things and how they all added up to big results. So next is our weekly meetings. Uh, and that's, that's because we also talk about these little wins in our, in our weekly um, meetings as a company, both in our office in New York and our office in Russia. So we, uh, we leave two minutes at the end of our weekly stand-ups to share these little wins. And people kind of just spontaneously stand up and they say the good things that have happened to them that week. And people kind of spontaneously start to applaud. And it's become a great, great part of our, of our culture with people sharing these good things that are happening, even on a small scale. So the next step was to earn trust through complete and total transparency and constant communication. So before this crisis, um, we didn't really share our financial information with our employees. It was kind of on a need-to-know basis. Afterwards, we decided that um, we could really not afford to lose a single other employee. And we had, rightfully so, a lot of employees who were very nervous about the state of the company. So we started on a quarterly basis to share all of the cash we had in the bank, what our revenues were, and how profitable we were. And we've been doing that ever since, and it's really helped. Um, we've gotten such great feedback on it that we've actually started to do it on a monthly basis. Next, I started writing a monthly newsletter um, it was kind of corny when I thought of it, um, but uh, I started doing it, and it's been very helpful. This is a place for me to connect with all of my employees. It gets translated and uh, sent to our Russian office, and it's actually something in a, working in a tech company that we print out and we put on everybody's desk so that when they come in uh, one morning a month, they, they see the newsletter. And it's a great chance for me to call out amazing behaviors that I'm seeing in the company and great performance, and also talk about areas that we need to improve. Um, more than anything, it gives a great line of communication between me and my employees in Russia, who I only see about once a quarter in person. 
So next, after the first few months that things started settling down, one of the first things we did is we took about 30 of our leaders, both from our Russian office and our New York office, to a corporate offsite. And we really sat down and kind of went through the tough stuff of figuring out what we wanted to do with the business for the next three years. So even though Kenny and I had an idea, it was something that we needed to get our entire leadership team on board with and to get them aligned with. Um, once the entire leadership team was lined around it, we brought it back to the entire staff, both in New York and Russia, and we spent a full day kind of socializing the ideas of our three-year vision to get alignment across the entire company. This is now something that sits on every single person's desk and that we train every new employee um, to learn about. Next is our goal setting. This now happens on a quarterly basis. Before the crisis, we used to set goals uh, twice a year. We now do it every single quarter. Uh, this is completely in line with that three-year vision I showed you. So it's all quarterly we're taking the steps to get to where we want to go to in the next three years. Um, the fun thing about our kind of quarterly goal setting is that we theme our quarterly goals. So the theme you're looking at here is called In Bloom. Every quarter we have a different theme and it allows us to kind of have a playful attitude around the office. So we theme out and decorate the office with whatever the theme is for that quarter. When we launched in Bloom, our office in New York and our office in Russia uh, were covered in fresh flowers when everybody came in that day and the office was decorated that way. All of our internal kind of memorandum is themed that way. So it allows us to kind of have alignment but also be playful with each other, which is really important. So step three was engineering resiliency and happiness. Um, and this sounds uh, kind of insane, I think, for some people. How can you actually engineer happiness? But many years ago, I started and uh, became fascinated with the idea of positive psychology, um, which is the study of how you can uh, engineer resiliency and happiness, essentially. And there are very specific st steps that you can take to become a happier person. And this was something that I really wanted desperately for our employees. They had been through a lot, and how could we kind of engineer greater happiness amongst them? The first and kind of most tried and true way is just simply through gratitude. It's very, very easy to think about, but it's hard to do in practice. So back to the sticky notes, which I obviously have a, th a thing for. Uh, we created these post-its um, that were just blank thank you notes. Um, and we put them on everybody's desk. And spontaneously, people started writing them out and thanking each other for different things. This is behind my desk. And I'll walk in, and there'll be a little thank you note on my on my monitor for something I did for somebody. And I try and myself write five to 10 thank yous a week that I stick on people's desks and monitors. You see these all around our office and they've really become kind of a cultural artifact for us. It, it, it is part and parcel of kind of what we do at the company right now. Um, and the best like little secret about it is that you actually feel even better when you write them than you do when you receive them. So we find people write them a lot. Next is providing a platform for recognition. So it was we were thanking each other and we were sharing our little wins, but we also wanted a place where we could talk about um, our values and celebrate our employees for living our values. And our values are fierce drive, positive energy, and living a full life. So we actually found a system that I'll talk about a little bit that we use for many of our performance management and, and goal tracking. It's called Seven Geese. Um, and that has a, a platform inside it that allows us to customize for our values. And the great thing here is that this is all peer-to-peer -peer recognition. So my employees in New York will often recognize our employees in Russia and vice versa for things that they've seen them do that align with our values. One of the uh, kind of central ways that you can gauge employee happiness and work satisfaction is actually through progress and meaning. The more an employee feels that they um, are making progress in their role and that their role has meaning, the more likely they are to be satisfied and happy uh, at the workplace. So it was really important for us to connect what we were doing, that three-year vision, all the way down to what people were doing on an employee-by-employee -employee basis. And we use that same system, Seven Geese, to actually connect the dots for people. So every quarter, all of our employees input their own goals. Those are um, often aligned with department goals or company goals. And the best thing is, because it's through software, you can actually see anybody else in the company and what they're working on. So employees will look at my goals for a quarter and know what it is that I'm responsible for, and they can comment on it or they can share it. And I can look at all of their goals as well. 
Um, and this is great because it's one kind of centralized place where they can see, wow, if I do this, it's going to have this impact on my department, which is going to have this impact on the company. So I'll get through this quickly because my time is running out. But uh, we also needed to cultivate constant feedback. And I know Bob talked a little bit about this yesterday as well. This is another thing we use our Seven Geese platform for. But it was incredibly important, given the sensitive nature of where we were as a company, that we had our finger on the pulse of how people were feeling at all times. So we really made it a priority to understand and prioritize getting feedback from employees. We do that in both um, non-anonymous ways like this, where every month we ask people, how happy are you? What can we be doing better? What's going well? And then also through uh, anonymous things like surveys. Um, more importantly, we actually trained people uh, on how to give and receive feedback. And we use that same SBO model that Bob mentioned yesterday. And then lastly, we really needed to show people the possibilities to get our mojo back. So we needed people not only to be believers in the company, but believers in themselves and their ability to change the fate of the company. We did that in two key ways. The first was the um, bonus framework. So before the crisis, we didn't actually believe in, um, in incentive-based compensation. We thought it would erode our culture and it was overly competitive for us. But afterwards, we realized that if we were going to ask people to help us grow the company back, that they needed to feel real ownership in the company. So we spent about eight months coming up with a new compensation plan uh, with a bonus structure that actually rewards all of our employees equally, regardless of their position in the organization, the office manager or the VP. And then lastly, because living a full life is one of our core values, we introduced something called the Infinite Possibilities Prize. We asked all our employees to share with us what they're super passionate about outside of the business. And twice a year, we reward people up to $25,000 towards living one of their dreams, whether it be um, helping to pay for a new car that they want or a trip around the world or skydiving. Um, I really truly believe that you can give people cash and they're really happy about that, but it's something they're f they'll forget maybe. Um, working for a company that helps them make their dreams come true is not something that they will ever forget. So just in conclusion, I want to say um, you can either look at, at situations like this with extreme adversity and you can crumble or you can decide that it's an opportunity for you to make better, but uh, the attitude does make all the difference, so thank you.